Hey, everybody. This is Serafina Scapicchio from San Diego Pride. I'm the director of philanthropy, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm so excited to bring you this content today. Um, as we know from the latest job report, one in five Americans are unemployed due to COVID-19 um, or facing a redu reduced work schedule. Um, and even prior to the COVID-19 crisis, LGBTQ Americans um, weren't having a great time in the job market. Um, they statistically across the board make less than their heterosexual counterparts um, and sometimes are not considered for leadership uh, positions in their companies. So what we want to do today is have some experts in their fields um, tell you some tips and some tricks that you can use to make your resume stand out and have a little bit of a discussion about what does it mean to be out in your job search um, or even out in your resume. So today I'm very, very, very lucky to bring you two LGBTQ leaders from companies in San Diego who truly value diversity and inclusion um, in their workforce. Um, um, and they, uh, that is Alex Riolo from Northrop Grumman um, and Noah Lomax from HP. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Hey, Serafina. Hi, Serafina. Hi, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for the hard work you put into this. I know um, you recruited a lot of resume reviewers for us for this workshop. Um, um, and you really put your company behind this presentation. So thank you. It's our pleasure. Likewise. Yeah, our pleasure. Take it away. <laughs> Great. Um, hi, folks. My name is Noah Lomax. I work at HP. I'm managing our global consumer services marketing team. And I also lead our San Diego Pride ERG, which is how I'm connected with Alex. So we get to do a lot of fun stuff together. So I'll let you introduce yourself. And I'm Alex Riolo. Professionally, I'm a project manager at Northrop Grumman, where I work in our supply chain. But uh, I also run the LGBT ERG group for our sector. Um, that's about six sites across the country. And my pronouns are he, him, his. Great. Uh, my pronouns are also he, him, his. Thanks for uh, including those, Alex. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, who is also a personal friend of mine. Uh, Taylor Meadows brings 10 years of experience to the table, <clears throat> having spent his professional tenure with uh, people operations at Apple, LinkedIn, and now Indeed. His current role as a marketing manager at Indeed allows him to leverage his public speaking background as a platform to educate employers and job seekers about what it means to find joy and meaning through professional identity. He holds a BA in public relations and advertising from The Ohio State University and has earned awards from his employees and peers, employers and peers for outstanding achievement in global em employer brand talent acquisition and recruiting. So we're really excited to have Taylor and I think he's gonna have a lot of great insights and information for everyone joining today. Thanks Noah. And it's my pleasure to introduce David Thompson who will be interviewing Taylor. David joined San Diego Pride's Board of Directors after five years of volunteer service to the organization, supporting its community partners and youth programs. David, the current Director of Diversity and Community Life at the Bishop School in La Jolla, is a proud Black, queer educator from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. For nearly 15 years, David's worked as a counselor, a navigator of institutional equity and inclusion, and an advocate for students. Hey, how's everyone going? Come on. Yeah. It's... Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Noah and Alex. It's good to see you. Welcome, Taylor. Thank you for having me. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, as we get this conversation started, Taylor, we've heard a little bit about your bio. Again, I'm David Thompson. Um, and I just wonder if you can tell us a little bit about uh, how you have been into the gotten to the position that you're in uh, and maybe what it's been like for you as an out LGBT professional. Yeah, thank you for the question and, and thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I have been out for uh, 13 years now, so it's been a part of my identity for, for quite some time. And, you know, I, I, I really kind of non-traditionally got to where I am. Um, my professional career started in a retail store. Um, I, uh, I worked uh, at Apple my, for, for about four and a half years. Uh, and really my first position was a front door concierge at an Apple store in Austin, Texas where I was greeting people walking in through the doors, checking them in for Genius Bar appointments, and just trying to create a good customer experience, selling iPhones and iPads uh, and Macs and all that good stuff. And you know that opportunity uh, just kind of began building upon itself and allowed me to just create new skill sets that you know, were, were getting me promoted and allowing me to, to lead teams and lead training initiatives and things like that. And I grew really, 
really passionate about uh, the employee experience uh, and what it means to truly find meaning and happiness at work, um, which then parlayed into my position at LinkedIn, which as you know, is a, so a social networking site for professional identity. Um, and then that experience then took me to Indeed, where Indeed was looking for uh, uh, public speakers and, 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 uh, and marketing managers to really kind of spread the word of what it means to find an inclusive job search. Um, and then for employers, how to brand themselves as employers of choice. So it was really my experience working at Apple and how great that it was that uh, kind of led me to where I am today. You know, <clears throat> I love hearing that story uh, because what it does is it reminds me and it reminds everyone, I think, that the journey is is often not linear. It's sort of, we, we take one step and then we take the next logical step, even if that step is not the step we want to anticipate it. Uh, and, and I think that the, recognizing the journey and the good things and the lessons that we learn through each step, as you said, sort of being in that front line doing that customer service work, uh, I think that that actually gives us all of the skills. So everything that we do matters because everything leads to the next thing. And I wonder when we think about that narrative and how to tell that story in a resume, what are some general elements that all good resumes have? Uh, I think especially in a tight job market like right now, um, what stands out to you? Yeah, it's a great question. It's one that I'm asked all the time. And so I think that it's multifaceted and, and I kind of wanted to just start with, you know, a resume is simply an extension of your professional identity, right? So it's meant to give a snapshot as to, um, you know, who you are and what you've worked on and, and what you're interested in working on in the future. You know, when I think of, uh, when I think of good resumes and um, while I no longer recruit talent, I can tell you that I always, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of initially looked at specific things on a resume that would capture my attention. So the first thing that I can tell you that all resumes have that is great um, is is good formatting. And and what do I mean by this? Um, is the resume easy to read? Um, is it visually appealing? Is there a nice balance between um, like bullet points and sentences? Um, you know. It, Something interesting to note is that recruiters on average spend around 30 seconds reading a resume. Um, and when it comes to first impressions, we actually did a research study at Indeed, um, and we make a first impression of, of someone uh, in, in less than a second. It's about six tenths of a second. And wow. so um, off the bat, right, we just need to make sure that our resume reads very cleanly, um, that it's easy to follow. Um, and that it stands out in a way that, um, that tells a good story. You don't need to over-engineer your resume uh, in, 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 through the lens of um, you know, having it be really fancy or have a lot of different colors in it. Um, as long as it's just sectioned out in a nice, clean, concise way, um, it's going to really help you. A common question that, uh, that I get asked that I, I also saw that, that one of our viewers asked us was about length. Um, you know, back, uh, you know, 10 plus years ago, uh, it was kind of commonplace to not exceed one page of a resume. Um, and that was simply because when uh, before the, the days of Indeed or LinkedIn, you were actually dropping your resume off in person at, at places. And I understand that that still happens sometimes. Um, but the idea is, is that you didn't exceed more than one page because then recruiters had uh, twice the amount of, of uh, opportunity to lose one page resume if you think about that so what I would recommend is is you know I know that it's hard to capture uh, you know a robust you know uh, tenure of experience on just one page so what my recommendation would be if you do have to bleed over into another another page um, that's okay just make sure that you print the resume uh, on a front and back of one piece of paper so that it all is captured in in one place instead of it being on on multiple pages I think that that is really important. Um, another important element to consider with, you know, with resumes specifically is just making sure that you have a variety of content in there. Um, and what do I mean by that? So uh, I'm gonna walk you quickly through some of the, the general uh, sections of a resume that I think could be really helpful. And pause me if you have any questions or want me to elaborate at any time. Um, but the first, the, the first uh, and most important piece is just to make sure that you have updated uh, contact information with a local address. Um, employers are much more likely to uh, interview someone who is local. 
Uh, the reason for that is, is when you have someone who is out of state, it's not impossible to get a job in a different city if you're living elsewhere. But it is important to recognize that people are going to recruiters are going to probably prioritize candidates who are local because a they can come in for interviews faster and b there's going to be less likelihood of having to relocate and spend money um, on that package for somebody. So um, so that is going to be very very important for you. I also uh, you know when I was reviewing resumes, I always looked for a catchy tagline or an objective line that explained really in one sentence um, who that person was and. Uh, you know, what they were interested in, in doing. Um, it kind of gave me a good indication of whether or not I should continue reading on. You know, as I said, if I'm gonna only spend 30 seconds on a resume as a recruiter, it's really important to kind of, uh, right, have that initial hook, if you will, um, to, in, you know, influence uh, that, that recruiter to want to read more. So I always found that to be really, really important. Yeah, Taylor, thank you for that. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that I, I don't know what my one line would be right now. <laughs> I I just send a picture, picture sort of like, what would I even say in mm -hmm. one sentence about myself? Uh, what recommendation do you have for that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, the, uh, as subjective as it sounds, the one thing that I would say is just be yourself and be authentic in, in that phrasing. Um, so for example, as a marketing manager at a tech company, um, and I work specifically with brands on you know how to how to build their their credibility as employers you know my my tagline would be something like um, I'm, I'm a compassionate tech professional uh, with robust experience in building brands teams and initiatives um, if you were let's say um, uh, maybe a server in the past or a bartender maybe you are a motivated and adaptable food service pro professional looking to apply your experience in a collaborative restaurant um, it's just a way to kind of paint a nice picture for uh, for, uh, for for the potential employer to kind of indicate then, now let me talk about my experience uh, and my day-to-day -day duties uh, that that could further kind of elaborate on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah, and so, you know, with that then, you know, you definitely want to round out your resume with things like past experience, volunteering opportunities, um, you know, oftentimes in, in a resume, um, what I like to do is, is make sure that you include right, the company that you had worked for, how long you were there, um, and then the location that, that, would, that, that they were in. But then what I like to do is include uh, at least you know, three to five bullets um, that start with action verbs about what it is that you did. Uh, kind of a key, a secret sauce, if you will, is to have each bullet point start with a different action verb. So, you know, managed, facilitated, contributed to, responsible for. Um, it's a great way to differentiate each line, but then also discuss the various elements that you were focusing on uh, you know, in your role. If you were ever in a, a position where you had a stretch project um, or um, you, know, you, you were supporting maybe an ERG, so much like myself, so my day-to-day -day job, right, I'm a marketing manager and I keynote speak, I travel a lot and I speak at conferences at industry events. But I also uh, am, am an executive lead for our pride group as well for remote employee engagement. I sit in Chicago and we don't have an office in Chicago. So um, oftentimes I'm traveling to New York City and to Austin, Texas, where we're, we're, you know, we are headquartered. But that is a big part of my time that I spend in my job. So I openly talk about uh, supporting pride initiatives at Indeed um, just because it is, in fact, a, a part of a part of my job. So I think that that can be and we can we can kind of uh, dig into that a little bit more um, as well and, and as it relates to what you can include and, and what you shouldn't include. But but that's really important. And then, you know, feel free to to, to talk about things like notable traits that you have. You know, are you a good listener or a team player? Are you adaptable, open to feedback? Like those are key words that uh, that we're are, are looking for when they are reviewing resumes. Um, notable skill sets. If you've uh, used uh, programs or, or technology tools in the past, or maybe in a past role, even if let's say you were uh, leveraging the Uber Eats app, right, to deliver food, right, that's that's a technology platform that you can talk about in your resume that you are well versed in. Um, it's a good way, Microsoft Office, those types of things. It's, it's a really good way to indicate. And then finally, you know, uh, educational experience, if, if you have it that you and you want to note it, and then awards, um, you know, have you uh, have you been, uh, you know, recognized for anything and maybe even in a volunteering uh, capacity, it doesn't it doesn't matter quite as much 
um, if the experience was, was directly in a, in a role at an employer. Um, but any, any way that you've been recognized um, uh, in the past is a great way to add some zhuzh to your resume. Nice, I love that word. You know, <laughs> Taylor, this is great. It, it, it's funny because I, I think about conversations that I have with young people, right? Folks who are going into the job market in many cases for the very first time, you're having conversations with, with folks who in some cases have been in the market uh, through various professions for, for decades. And it still sounds like at the baseline, what stands out the most are gonna be those key words, those key phrases that allow a person to really highlight the best qualities of themselves. And even though those those skills are going to be different for each one of us, some will have managing experience, others will have collaboration experience or teamwork, or, or I'm hearing many, many different types. What's nice, though, is that when you put all of that together, you actually have this robust pool of mm. viable candidates. And yeah, so, yeah. yeah. That really inspires a thought. Something that, that, that I always look for, and this is what I always advise people on, um, you know, a resume does not need to be bland and boring. Um, and I don't even necessarily mean in its design. It's I'm talking about the wording and the phrasing. So I am somebody who typically will uh, write my resume in the first person. So instead of talking about myself in the third person in a robotic way, I really try to keep it as hum humane as possible. Um, at the end of the day, and, and this is I advise my clients on this all the time. You know, we're people before we're employees. So, you know, give your recruiter a, a glimpse into who you are and, and to how you write and, and to what it is that you're interested in. And then let those keywords then um, act as kind of the science behind how you appear in a, in a search result. But I always kind of advise on that art and science. It's, it's a balance. But feel free to put your personality into it because that's going to allow you to stand out from someone else. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you. Uh, so we think about the structure of the resume. We've got the resume together. What's next? Online profiles uh, have come to carry more weight in the last 10 years. Uh, what networking tools do Indeed or LinkedIn have that LGBTQ uh, people should be taking advantage of? Yeah, so um, right there's a reason why I've, I've been in this industry uh, for, for the amount of time that I have now. So um, I suppose the best way to answer that is to maybe uh, discuss Indeed first, and then we can talk about LinkedIn. Um, it's kind of funny because people always, uh, well, people, I guess, view us as competitors, even though we're, we're not, right? Because, um, it, you know, Indeed is a search engine, more like a Google for jobs, and LinkedIn is a social networking site, more like a Facebook for jobs. Um, but the two work uh, in tandem very, very well. Uh, I just happen to have experience working at, at both companies. But um, we'll start with Indeed. So, um, as I said, right, Indeed is a search engine. It's not a static job board. So, you know, 10 years ago-ish, you know, we had like Career Builder, we had Monster and things like that. Indeed is different than that in that we go out into the internet every single day and we aggregate jobs that are posted on company career sites and bring them into one place. In fact, we have over 25 million jobs on our site and we bring in about 10 new jobs every single second. Um, so for job seekers out there who are looking for roles, Indeed is going to be the most up-to-date place to find a job because it's all automated technology on the back end that, you know, if, uh, if Northrop Grumman, for example, is, uh, has posted a job on their, on their website, we are going to automatically pull that into our website so that it's a, it's a one-stop shop to find all open positions. Um, so that's really great. You know, the design of Indeed is super simple, easy to use. Um, just like Google, right? You basically go to Indeed and you tell us what you're what you're looking to do. You can start with keywords, you can start with job titles, you can even just start with the location of where you live and see what's available there. And I would say that the the nice the beauty about Indeed is that it's kind of a a, a two way highway, if you will. And what I mean by that is, as a job seeker, I can go to Indeed and I can search for open positions. Uh, and I can narrow down right where I want to apply. But then similarly, uh, and I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you know, you've spent a lot of time updating your resume, getting it into a spot that you feel really good with, feel really comfortable with. You can now go to Indeed and create a free profile and then upload your resume to your profile. So you can go in and we also will uh, ask you to take an assessment. Uh, and it's a great way for us to match you with jobs automatically. But what's great about this, and, and, and I don't know if a lot of people know this, this is actually true for Indeed and for LinkedIn, um, but recruiters will pay both of our companies back-end access 
to go in and run candidate searches. And we're able to find, they're able to find candidates based on the resume data that's uploaded. So I would highly encourage you, if you have a resume or if you're working on a resume right now, one of the best ways to get discovered uh, is to go into Indeed and upload that resume. Um, and it's just, it's a simple message that comes into your inbox on Indeed and into your email. Uh, so, you know, I, I would encourage you as you're applying to jobs, make sure that that part is completed uh, because it's gonna allow you to be found while also applying to jobs at the same time. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, um, it's really helpful. If you go to indeed.com, uh, one of the one of the the things that I wanted to mention, I'm I'm because I'm very proud of the team that worked on this. Um, right at the very top of indeed.com, we have an entire resource center for all things navigating job search during COVID-19. So um, if you are interested in understanding how to tailor your resume during this time, what companies are hiring right now, we have a very, very robust uh, landing page for job seekers and employers actually to navigate this right now. Um, so I would highly encourage you uh, to do that if you haven't already. It's going to be very, very helpful. Now, uh, if we transition to LinkedIn. So what's great about LinkedIn is that this is the place where you get to engage and really create connections. So um, I always say, you know, go to Indeed and find the job uh, and maybe even a potentially apply to it, but then go to LinkedIn and see who works there. You might have connections that already work there and you might even be able to find a recruiter that works there as well. Um, LinkedIn's got a ton of jobs too. They've got 20 million jobs um, and it's a great place for you to, to build a personal profile for yourself that kind of mirrors your resume. So while on LinkedIn, it's not as much about uploading your resume, but creating kind of an online identity for yourself, um, you'll notice that it's very similar uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, but it's a great place to talk about the places you volunteered, um, if you've supported Pride initiatives, uh, great place to talk about that, right? It's kind of a soft, uh, a soft entry point into defining your identity if you want to disclose that. It's a great place to make connections, uh, intake content that companies are posting about initiatives that they're working on, especially in June. What I would recommend is create a LinkedIn account and go in and, and, and LinkedIn will ask you, you know, what type of content are you interested in, in you know, uh, receiving on your feed? And June is Pride Month. So if you're interested in really understanding what companies are supporting Pride initiatives and the ones that are really leveraging right uh, their their LGBTQIA employees uh, to to build greater connection in the workplace and to really kind of maybe determine where you want to apply. That would be a great place uh, to do it and a great a great time to do it. So using the two together is going to be amazing. Um, it's going to really kind of cover a lot of bases for you. LinkedIn does have the opportunity to upgrade to a premium account. Uh, which is where you get like enhanced analytics and you, you can reach out to people that you're not connected to. But I say this because uh, the first month is free. It's usually, I think, about $30 a month, but the first month is free. So if you're looking for an enhanced profile, that would be something that I would recommend taking advantage of. Great. Wow. There's so much good information here. I find myself just taking so many notes. Uh, well, good one this is great. Uh, one thing that you mentioned that I, I want to just make sure that I, I understand clearly is that with Indeed being a, a Google for, for jobs versus LinkedIn as Facebook for jobs, with that engagement being different, uh, you mentioned that there are keywords that recruiters can go in and look for. Uh, and looking at that with the resume, as, as we had given some tips on how to strengthen that resume, are there a couple of keywords that you you recommend really making sure if it's applicable, find their way onto um, a person's resume? Yeah, so, um, you know, like I said, I, I think that it's kind of balancing the art and science of what you've done and what you're passionate about. So, you know, definitely leading with adjectives um, is gonna be helpful for you. Um, so what employers do and what, what recruiters do is they build out these long, complex search strings in, in both Indeed and in LinkedIn. And essentially what they do is, is they are looking for both uh, skill sets of the role that they are looking to hire, as well as uh, soft adge adjectives that describe who a person is and, and, and kind of who, and, and characteristics of who they are. So words like patient, compassionate, um, motivated, eager, like those types of things are, are great. But then, you know, they're also going to be searching for things like project management, 
Or uh, you know, let's say that it's a let's say that Chase right uh, is looking for bank tellers. They're going to search for the word bank teller. Um, they're going to search for the word money, um, fi financial. So what I would recommend doing in this case is to to make sure that you are using keywords that are tailored specifically to the role that you're applying for. A good trick of the trade is to pull up the actual job description um, of the of the position that you're interested in and look and see what keywords they have listed in the job description itself. From there, you can you can then kind of extract keywords that stand out to you and then pepper them into your own resume so that they more so right because you're you are almost facilitating a match between who you are, what your experience is, and who they are looking for. And then another trick is to actually go into um, either the company page of of an employer on Indeed or LinkedIn or on just if you Google um, you know uh, careers at Apple careers. Um, you know, at Target, whatever that might look like, and see what their mission statement is and see what their values are. That's also a great uh, kind of way to, to see what keywords they might look for in people. And then again, you can take those keywords and then you can use them, uh, you, know, in, you know, in your resume to kind of create that or help facilitate that match when people are looking for, for candidates. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, Moving on from there, it's great that you're talking about institutions uh, having mission and value. Uh, you and I are very fortunate to work um, for companies, for institutions that support our queer identities, that, that see um, their employees uh, for who they are, uh, in addition to the work that they bring. Uh, but we know that hiring biases do exist. Uh, for example, transgender people are five times more likely to be unemployed uh, than their cisgender siblings. Queer people statistically earn less uh, than their heterosexual counterparts. We heard some of this from Serafina as we began this conversation. And so through your lens, how can LGBT people protect themselves in their job search? You've mentioned ERGs, uh, employee resource groups, um, but not every company has those. So what are considerations uh, what, what are the considerations of including LGBT community vol volunteer work, uh, other types of advocacy, for example, on a resume? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> so look, here's what, I'll start by saying this. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate to have worked for tech companies that do support uh, an, an inclusive, diverse environment, but uh, we're, we're, in the, we're in the process right now of it just becoming somewhat normalized. Uh, like, for example, when I was at Apple from 2010 to 2014, Tim Cook hadn't even come out yet. Um, Apple didn't even have a pride group yet. Um, and now, uh, if you look at photos from, I think it was either last year or the year before that in San Francisco Pride, Apple had like 25,000 people walk in the parade. So it just goes to show how, how quickly it's, it's come. But I'll tell you, you know, even Indeed, right, um, as inclusive and um, wonderful as Indeed is about diversity in our own workplace, I have to be honest with you, when I go, when I travel for client meetings or if I'm especially traveling down in the south somewhere, you know, unfortunately, I, I will admit, I still, I'm still very mindful about how I, you know, position myself, how I talk, my hand gestures, like, right, all those nonverbal cues, but you'd be surprised how many people are more uh, accepting than, than you would think. Um, and a large part of that has to do with uh, that, the fact that a lot of companies now are being measured on their diversity metrics. So what I would say to, to all of our viewers and to people out there, when you're thinking about putting together your resume, when you're thinking about when you're applying to jobs, you know, you don't necessarily need to right like wave the gay flag and indicate to someone, Hey, right? Like I'm gay. However, I do think it's very important to be authentic in your approach. So um, I think that on a resume, for example, you know, uh, when you are talking about a role or you're wanting to apply to a, a position, right? Positions are agnostic. Um, but I would say, you know, if you have volunteered in the past for uh, LGBTQIA, you know, organizations you've you've supported, let's say you even donated a couple hours at a pride parade and you want to talk about that, right? That's going to indicate that you're either, that you either A, identify or that B, you're an ally. And right, allyship is great too. So, right, and just as, uh, and, and you know, it's that's non-binary itself. You know, I don't identify as black, but I'm certainly an ally on behalf of the black community. 
And so it's a great way for you to uh, you know, paint a picture of, of how you support other, other groups of people that are different from yourself. So maybe what you do is, is you balance a resume with uh, causes or uh, you know uh, organizations you've uh, supported for you know for a group that you identify with, but maybe you also talk about groups that you've supported that you don't identify with, and talk about your allyship for other people. What that does is that allows recruiters then to infer a a little bit more about who you are as a person, um, and it it really showcases leadership you know qualities. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, a lot of companies are are coming around to the idea of of diverse candidates. I can tell you that even at Indeed, um, something that I'm super uh, proud of is uh, for those transitioning, uh, you know, at, at, at the company, we have full benefits that support that. Now, I realize that not every company does, but a lot of tech companies are moving that direction. So that's good news. But if you are going to be interviewing for a position that might be at more of a conservative organization or maybe one that just isn't overtly supportive, uh, you know, I would say just be mindful of that presentation, but also listen. And if you are on the phone with with a, let's say, you know, a potential employer, um, maybe a question, you know, of course, what an, uh, a recruiter is going to always do is ask you what questions you have for them. Maybe one of the questions is, is what ways do you feel supported in your workplace? Uh, or what, in, you know, what initiatives from a diversity and inclusion perspective do you support? Um, do you have employee resource groups? And if you do, can you elaborate what those are? Uh, maybe the ones that you're a part of and let the recruiter, you know, tell you about the way in which the company supports diversity and inclusion. But I'll tell you what, if a if an employer comes to the table or responds to you with, I really don't have an answer to that or, um, you know, I'll have to get I'll have to get back to you, then I would maybe then encourage you to continue your search elsewhere. Because at the end of the day, right, you, we spend more time at work than we do at home sometimes. And you know, let's say that you are applying to be a server or a bartender somewhere. There are a lot of restaurants out there that do embrace and support diverse people. Um, and so I would say if you are getting the vibe just by listening to a recruiter talk that it's not going to be an inclusive, um, you know, uh, mindful environment for you, then I would maybe say that that's not the place that you want to invest the rest of your time. No, no, I think that's that's such great advice. Um, because something you said earlier was that we are people before we are employees. Mm. Um, and I, I, and I yeah. say that again. I genuinely believe that. Yeah, and 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 I think we we owe it to ourselves to recognize that. Mm. Uh, and and I also recognize that in the current market, it's it's tough to begin to to discern, if you will, companies that do and do not uh, support identities outside of what we would consider traditional, right? Uh, right? There's a wide spectrum. And so I guess another question that I, that I have for you kind of in line with this is, do you have any advice for a person who is going into that conversation unsure, right? Maybe maybe, maybe where, where they are is in a position uh, where they, they've decided that the job market is, the job search is a little bit more important right now than putting forward some of the characteristics of my identity. What advice might you recommend for a person who is careful um, if not un uncertain. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, what I would say is do your research. So um, one thing that you can do, so a unique offering, for example, that Indeed has uh, is employee reviews. Um, Glassdoor is another website that you could go to to read uh, reviews about what it's like to work at a, at a company. I can tell you that Glassdoor and Indeed actually roll up to the same parent company. Um, so while we are two different brands, we technically belong to the same parent. Um, and one thing that we are uh, asking a lot of job seekers on is, you know, how di you know how inclusive is your work environment? We actually just rolled out at Indeed something called the Work Happiness Score. So if you visit uh, the name of an employer on on Indeed, for example, you can actually see how people rate their experience, uh, you know, uh, through the lens of diversity and inclusion at their company. So if you're unsure about an organization or um, how someone might you know, respond to that. I would say that there are multiple different resources that you can tap into to, to see, you know, what other sentiments are of people who have already worked there or who currently work there. Um, I can tell you that we have partnerships um, with uh, websites like Comparably, Fairy God Boss, and her site uh, for people to rate their experiences as women in the workplace. 
So that's, you know, that those are great resources for you. Um, but we're also asking, you know, questions through the form of a review, like how, you know, uh, you know, what projects have you supported that directly influence diversity inclusion at your company? Um, do you feel a sense of belonging on your team? And can you elaborate why? And then we rate that with a score. So what I would recommend is simply, you know, dig a little bit and, um, you know, see what information is available on that, you know, on that employer. I would be willing to bet that with the amount of, of you know, people, at least on Indeed, I can tell you, we have about 250 million people who visit the site every single month. So as you would imagine, there are a lot of reviews. I mean, I think that we have around 100 million reviews on the site. So there's a lot of information at your disposal. Um, you can look to see like what the sentiment is on leadership, on management, uh, on work-life balance, on, you know, uh, on benefits and compensation and things like that. So diversity and inclusion metrics are going to be included into that. So it's going to be a very great kind of comprehensive place for you to be able to get a good sense of whether or not it's a it's an environment that you can see yourself thriving in. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Yeah. This has been such good advice. Uh, I find I, I'm I find I'm learning a lot uh, from you having this conversation, and and we've been doing this work. Um, uh, good. Yeah. So I want to take some time. We're going to capture a couple of questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, so please um, continue to submit. Uh, those of you who are watching, if anything comes up, please send send it your way. We're going to start uh, with one question. Should I include experiences outside of work? You touched on this a little bit, but maybe we could say a little more. Yeah. Um, short answer is yes, definitely. Um, I always love uh, learning about people's experience outside of the workplace as well. Um, so, uh, you know, if you have... Like I said before, if you have worked uh, on volunteering committees, um, you know that's great. If you've been a caretaker for someone in your family, that's great to talk about too, right? Caretaking for someone is a form of leadership, um, so it's a great way to to discuss that. Um, you know, if you have, uh, you know, if you've, um, you know, walked in a parade, um, or if you have, uh, you know, I have a friend of mine right now who is literally uh, voluntarily living in New York City. He's a nurse. He's donating his time right now to help. Uh, you know, the New York City metro area, you know, fight COVID. Um, those are all amazing things to talk about. Um, I, I think that, you know, if you play sports, sports is an amazing repository of content to pull from, because again, it's all about leadership, teamwork, collaboration, empathy, uh, you know, competition. I mean, there's so many things that you can tap into um, that are great. You know, it's all about, um, you know, transferable skill sets and employers, um, you know, are looking for you to expand upon these things in an interview. Um, you know, I can share with you that, uh, you know, for example, um, I remember, you know, when I was uh, when I was interviewing at Apple, um, you know, it was one of the questions that, that I was asked was, you know, um, what is the most important thing you've worked on that you're most proud of that did not come from employment? And I remember thinking, like, I have to think about that. Um, but, you know, I remember, you know, supporting Special Olympics, um, you know, I remember, right, there, there are so many things that, that I was able to draw upon. I had to ask if I could take a second to just reflect on what that meant for me, um, because it's not a question that you get commonly asked, but people are very, uh, very quick to want to know, you know, who you are. And now that we're moving into this place where, you know, mission statements and, and vision statements for the company are so important. And we know that oftentimes, right, happy customers make happy employees. Um, you know, it's, it's really important to draw upon those experiences. Um, I would say if you are applying for, and this is just off the top of my head, but if you are applying for um, a retail position, um, you know, talk, talk about your experience, um, you know, in, you know in, in that store, for example, um, right? It doesn't need to be so linear uh, you know, in your approach, but it could be a great way to um, to talk about that. Maybe in, even in your in your objective statement, you say, um, as a happy customer of uh, you know of Target for 20 years, uh, I'm looking to apply my knowledge and experience, uh, you know, in a customer facing capacity or whatever that might look like. But there's definitely a myriad of different ways that you can kind of sculpt that uh, to talk about right experience that you've had that's not just related to a position you've had in the past. Right. You know, and thank you, because it, 
as we've talked about, these connections exist. Yeah. Something you mentioned that I, I hope we can just take a moment to reflect on is that you said it took, you said you had to take a moment to reflect on the answer. You said, I need a minute to think about that. In all of the interviews that I've had, all of the interviews that I've conducted, that moment of pause is, is often a really defining moment in the conversation. Uh, because what I have noticed is that when we are in interview settings, when we're in settings that are new and want to make that first impression, I often recognize that that first impression tends to get in the way of our patient response. And the patient response is actually what an employer would see if and when uh, you are in the position of working. So even being able to say, you know what, let me take a second to think about that, that is huge because it reminds the person interviewing you uh, that you do not always have the answer right away, mm. but in fact, you're able to be thoughtful in your approach to think of what is needed in this moment and how do we best go about it. So thank exactly. you for highlighting that moment. Yeah, you know, that's something that we call a therapeutic pause. And it's, uh, you know, even just saying to, you know, the person sitting across that table from you, do you mind if I take a minute to think about that? I really want to provide you a thoughtful answer. That in and of itself will tell an employer that you are willing to take a moment, collect yourself, um, and produce a, an answer of quality versus an answer of, of quantity. And listen, interviews can be uncomfortable. I get that. One of the initiatives that I'm working on with employers right now is how to be less rigid with candidates in interviews because, right, I mean, oftentimes we get asked these questions that are hard to answer in an authentic, fluid way. But there's a way as a job seeker for you to be able to kind of slow that conversation down with something like that. Um, and then that in itself is going to show mindfulness and thoughtfulness um, as to who you are as a person. Well, perfect. And so speaking of questions that just kind of keep coming, right? Wow. Uh, how should I emphasize my achievements when they are complex and need too much context to be meaningful? Yeah, so I would say on a, a, Honestly, you know, try to just summarize them as best as you can. And this is something that I want you to keep in mind is that the resume, your, your LinkedIn profile, whatever it might be, it's meant to just provide a glimpse into who you are, right? It, it's a summary of, of who you are. But the idea is, is that you just want to give the recruiter or the hiring manager enough insight to understand, you know, uh, maybe what the achievement was or, uh, you know, what you did accomplish to motivate them to want to ask more questions. So oftentimes in an interview, right, a recruiter will say, you know, I saw in your resume that you won an award for, you know, outstanding community service, uh, you know, contribution, uh, you know, for over, you know, over the Thanksgiving, you know, day weekend. What, can you elaborate on that for me? Like, what, what did that entail? Um, and honestly, from there, it just, it, it the, the conversation then becomes much more fluid and it becomes much more, um, uh, I guess, friendly in, in nature. Um, you know, I can tell you that uh, one of the one of the things that one of the very first things I talked about in my in my interview with Indeed um, is starting the, the the pride chapter at LinkedIn here in the Chicago office. Um, and it's because, you know, my my leader at the time uh, came from a minority background as well and was interested in learning more about that so that we could contribute to Indeed's uh, you know, employee resource group strategy. And so, um, you know, what a wonderful way to kick off an, an interview because it wasn't what I was expecting, but it allowed me to a kind of elaborate on an achievement I was I was proud of. Um, and, but also then allowed me to, to be open about my identity. And then that got that out of the way really quickly. So by you kind of listing those, uh, you know, ach achievements, even if they are long in nature, try to just shorten them up and give enough information to inspire someone to want to ask more questions. Perfect. So, do you have any suggestions for shifting from one field to the next? Uh, for instance, someone who might go from student services to human resources or organizational development. Um, how how do you build a resume to focus on a new field? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. So, um, it goes back to transferable skill sets. So, you know, think about. Uh, skill sets that you have learned in your existing role and how they can apply to a new role that you're going for. So like student services, for example, um, transitioning to, you said HR mm -hmm. as an example. So that to me, the, the immediately what would come to mind would be uh, like empathy and effective communication. 
So that would be something that that would translate very well to someone, you know, in HR coming from student services, um, working with young people, right? Things like that. Um, I would say that you know, just, you know, you know, consider if um, you are a bartender, right? Uh, that you come from a fast paced environment and with the ability to to multitask. If you had come, if you have worked in a bank in the past, right, you've worked with money um, and, uh, you know, you uh, you're able to be operationally efficient. If you're in retail, you have customer service skills. So it's what I would recommend is just think about uh, what you've learned in your current role and then just speak to how that can apply to uh, the new position that you're applying for. Um, I think that that honestly is the only way to go. I can tell you that here's a good example. When I was at Apple and I was a I was in the retail store and I was just I was selling products, you know, on a, on a daily basis. Um, I also had an interest. One of my side projects was uh, new hire onboarding. And that was my first uh, my that was my first kind of go at public speaking on behalf of the company at the time. I was based in Austin, Texas, but I represented four retail stores, two of them in Austin, two of them in San Antonio. And so all new hire training uh, combined all four stores. So I would be up in front of anywhere between 20 and 60 people at a given time, right? Walking them through a three day kind of, you know, onboarding module of what it means to work at Apple. That singular experience for me was, was uh, so affirming of my desire to want to go into public speaking, for, which I understand is, is a rare thing for, for someone to be interested in, um, but it, it just spoke to me. And so what I was able to then do is when you know, Indeed came along and said, we're developing this new team uh, and it's going to largely be you traveling to conferences and industry events and speaking to large groups of people about Indeed's mission and about how we're innovating to make the job seeking experience better. It felt like that it's a glove, it fits like a glove. So what I would encourage you to do is just think about those, those experiences you've had at work that really speak to you, that feel like you've, you've been great at, and then think about how you can apply them to your next role in the future. Yeah. Well, and it also sounds like those public speaking people uh, should make sure that they're highlighting the fact that they like public speaking. Because if I hear you say that that's not something that everyone likes to do, remember if you like doing it to highlight it. Absolutely. Like I can tell you, I am not into number crunching. I am not a detail oriented person. Um, like do not ask. Um, Noah will appreciate this because as Noah said, he and I are, are good friends uh, uh, in real life. But I do not ask me to plan your your birthday or a dinner. I'm just or a vacation. Not good at it. Just I will details will fall through the cracks. Um, so I would much rather be open about that um, as opposed to uh, pretending that I'm good at something, getting assigned to do something, and then letting it and then having it fall flat. But there are other ways that I can contribute um, that are more meaningful um, and more impactful. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, that makes great sense. I think we're going to move on to some questions coming in uh, from live. Great. All right. So just figuring out how this technology works. <laughs> OK, perfect. Uh, what advice do you have for older LGBT people uh, that are looking for employment, um, considering maybe someone who's been laid off after 30 years? Yeah, oh, that's such a tough spot to be in. Um, for for whoever asked that, I am just I, I'm I, you know I'm so sorry that that that, that happened. Um, but what I can tell you though is uh, you know especially for you know people in my generation, I'm a millennial. I love working uh, and learning from from you know people who are older than me with more experience. So what I can recommend for you is to just be very vocal about wanting to connect with. Uh, people who maybe think differently from you or wanting to learn from people who are younger with different skill sets from you. You know, I'm so passionate about what we call cross-generational recruiting um, and creating bridges between, right, boomers and Gen Xers, millennials, and now even Gen Zers who are younger than me. I, perfect example. Um, I mean, I just got on TikTok. I, I didn't know what it was for the longest time. And I was like, I, I finally had that moment of like, I can't believe that I'm old enough to not know what this is and to not really want to know what it is. However, yeah. I also recognize that like, it's a platform that a lot of people are using for, for good as well. So I think that being vocal about um, the skill sets that you do have, but that you are open to new environments, that you're adaptable, and that you also want to learn from people who are different than you is gonna be a really seamless way 
to showcase that you um, are willing to grow uh, and you're willing to change. And you know what I would recommend is uh, you know look at this as a new chapter, right? Uh, uh, I know I you know listen. I have had so many friends who have been laid off during uh, this pandemic. Um, uh, you know, almost 40 million people have filed filed for unemployment. So you are not alone. Um, it doesn't make the situation any more bearable. Um, but what I can tell you is, is 30 years of experience is a is a lot of really wonderful experience. And so really draft upon the you know the projects that you've worked on, the teams that you've built, whatever that might look like, um, and speak from the heart about that. And it's going to it's going to lend yourself. Um, you know, an upper hand. And don't be afraid to talk about, you know, your involvement in the LGBTQ community. Honestly, I, I would, I know that it has, that even, you know, 10, 20 years ago was, was a big no-no, do not talk about it. Um, the one thing that I can say, and we're not gonna get political here, but I think that we all are on the same page as to how we feel about that. Um, the world is, is trending in, in a good direction in many ways. Um, and so, like I said before, identify companies that are open and inclusive, uh, you know, to, to those of us that identify and, and those of us who are supportive um, and begin your search there. And I think that you'd be surprised as to how many, how many employers would see that as an asset and not a liability. Okay. Uh, and, and tacking onto that, uh, when you talked earlier about the length of a resume, Mm. Um, but keeping uh, older job seekers in mind, how far back should the resume go uh, to show the depth of experience while also showing, as you've described, uh, a willingness to work with a, a changing generation? Yes, so that's a great point. So uh, my answer to that is, is it's actually less about length and more about quality of experience. So if you built a big team uh, or led a really big initiative and it was, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, it's okay to talk about that. But you know, depending on your age, like in my resume now, I mean, I don't talk about the projects that I led in high school. I don't, and I'm 33 at this point, right? So I mean, I've been out of, I graduated from college in 2009. So I mean, I've been out of school for, for a minute. Um, I don't necessarily draft upon my experiences uh, in, in college anymore. Um, however, you know, I was a part of our undergraduate student government program. And I, you know, I have, I have that just as one line on there. So what I've, but I'll tell you what, the between my graduation and starting at Apple, I waited tables, I, I you know, I, I volunteered, and that's information that I don't have on my resume anymore because it's just less applicable to what I'm doing now. So I would say wherever you're at or in your career journey or whatever you're looking to do next, just ask yourself, is this piece of information sticky enough or relevant enough for me to keep on in here? Would this be something that a recruiter would want to ask me about? And if the answer is no, then then I would leave it off. So I would say, you know, like I said, less about how back, uh, how how uh, far back you date the experience, and more about does this speak to what I'm wanting to do now? Thank you, Taylor. Uh, our next question: uh, You mentioned that local applicants should leave their addresses on a resume. Uh, do you have similar tips for applicants looking for jobs outside of their current location? Yes. So if you are looking to uh, to move elsewhere, um, one thing that you might consider doing is seeing if you could maybe use the address of a, a close friend or a family member in that in that place um, to put on, you know, to, to use as a mailing address, if you will. Um, be prepared, though, if some, you know, if they ask you to come on site for an interview. It's just going to be it's going to be a matter of getting there. Um, you know, like I said, I, I know, and especially now that we're going to be entering a competitive job market with people needing to reentry back into work. Um, I just want to be realistic about that for you. So that is a trick that you can do is you, you can put someone else's address on there. Um, but if you're also to if you're willing to relocate yourself to a new city, then it that then that's a, a different conversation you might have than your. your uh, your own local address on your resume. And maybe in that objective line, you say, I'm looking to relocate to Dallas, Texas for career opportunities in this, this, and that. So I get automatically, right, the recruiter will know that you're not local, but you're willing to get yourself there. Um, that could be something that could help you as well. Um, 
I can just share with you that relocation is just something that is becoming less and less apparent. And if that is a requirement that you have, then you're going to be prioritized. You know, you are going to be less prioritized to that employer to someone who's already local that they don't need to, quite frankly, right, spend the, spend the money on relocating. Thank you. Uh, and I imagine too, we're entering a time where relocation is really a matter of where from where we can work virtually. Right, as companies move and shift, I, I, I imagine that that's part of the conversation for the future too. Yeah, and you know, what's actually great about that, and this is, I, I'm so glad that you just mentioned that because this is gonna be important also. Um, you know, especially in light of COVID, yeah, remote work opportunities are going to skyrocket. In fact, um, I, I don't know the exact statistic, but I wanna say that the keyword search for remote, the, the keyword remote has like, lifted by 400% on Indeed in the last two months. We actually even created a filter for just remote work opportunities um, you know, on Indeed. So what I would recommend doing is uh, when you, you can do two things, when you upload your resume to, uh, to Indeed specifically, you can hashtag it with ready to work. And then that will indicate to recruiters that you are open to new opportunities right now. And then you can also then filter your job search with the, with the remote filter so that you can see if the, if the position is not necessarily just located in one city, um, but if it's something that you can do from your, from your house. So uh, David, thank you for saying that because I would be, I would have been disappointed in myself if I didn't include that. Um, so that remote filter is going to be so helpful. And then hashtagging your resume ready to work will allow you to be found by recruiters even faster. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who uh, has been watching, who's been taking notes, who's submitted questions. Uh, certainly, we always have more questions than we do time. Uh, but we are, it looks like we've got uh, just maybe two minutes left. I'm going to see if we can get through one more, um, sure. if that's okay. Uh, sure. We have uh, one that just came in, says, I have had many people look at my resume as I applied to the healthcare field, but I have not gotten the next steps in terms of getting an interview. Uh, what should I do to ensure getting an interview the next time? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, and healthcare specifically is really challenging right now because uh, even in the midst of COVID, there's been a lot of layoffs happening in healthcare right now. Um, something that I could recommend for you is, you know, um, you know, it's one thing to just apply to a job, uh, you know, kind of just. Uh, you know, blankly online. One of the that's one of the things that we're working on at Indeed is, is to try to help solve that. But I would say if you know anyone specifically at that hospital system, doctor's office, whatever that might look like, who could either give you or would be willing to give you a referral or a reference, that is going to be really helpful for you as well. Anytime that you can do that, regardless of the industry, it's going to help out. Um, and then the other thing too is, is you know, hop on LinkedIn and see if you can identify a recruiter at that hospital um, or whatever healthcare system you're, you're applying to, and then maybe send them a, a connection request. And in that connection request, you can then input a personal note, and then you can introduce yourself and say that you've applied to the job, indicating, right, that, that maybe they that your name is, is one that they could look at on the list of, of applicants. So um, while it may not work every single time, it's at least a way to make a personalized introduction um, without actually meeting that that individual um, firsthand. So those two things I think could really help you in that case. Thank you very much, Taylor. You're welcome. Okay, looks like Serafina will be joining us in just a sec. Hi guys, thank you Hi, so Serafina. much for this wonderful conversation. It has been so inspiring for folks and um, we really appreciate you both for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, it was such a pleasure to be here. Well, San Diego Pride will be giving more and more of this type of virtual programming as we move forward through this crisis together. Um, so I hope today has been helpful for you. I know that we've received nearly 100 resumes through the drop form. So if you haven't uploaded yours yet, please do. Um, and if you are able, if you're in a position to, um, to support this type of programming, I would ask that you make a donation, sdpride.org forward slash donate. We're doing this. Uh, free to our community and support. So if you're in a position where you can support this kind of work moving forward, please do. And thank you. Have a wonderful day. Um, our program staff will be reaching out soon to connect you uh, with your resume reviewer.